So thank you, Emilio. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. And to all of you who are out there in the Zoom land, I can't see you, but uh, this is life during the pandemic. So uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, if you look in the top left of this image, you see Woods Hole. I'm on Cape Cod. We're surrounded by water. And this is the Marine Biological Laboratory that's been around since uh, 1888. So it's been in the US for a long time. I know that's a short time in Europe, but for us, it's a long time. So uh, you see at the bottom, you see an octopus there, and you see sort of an art drawing. You see a squid hatchling. You see the skin. What I'm going to try to do today is take you out to the ocean, and we'll look around a little bit and see what these animals do. But I'm going to talk about, you know, how they change their pattern, uh, how they use it. And in this case, uh, you look at the subtitle, how can we apply some science to things that humans want to do with these ideas? Wouldn't you all love to have the ability to change the color of your clothes or your car or whatever? And that's not too far in the future. And you need an animal model for that, or you need some model will help the engineers. So on all of my grants and my work, we work uh, collaboratively with material scientists and engineers who can take the ideas and the principles of color change and so forth and translate them into materials that humans want or think they want. So that's kind of where we are. So let's go diving without further ado. And here we are underwater on a back reef in the Caribbean. It's just a big hunk of rock out there and a fish swimming around, kind of nothing going on till now. And that octopus was there all the time. Uh, it now flashes white and in inks in my face and swims away. And if we look at that in slow motion, you have smooth white skin. Now watch the ring around the eye. That's 5 million spots in the skin called chromatophore organs innervated directly from the brain. So it's like electric skin. Another 25 million create the pattern. Watch where my cursor is. The smooth skin morphs and shape shifts into three dimensions. And so you not only get uh, an optical illusion, but you get a shape illusion too. And so if the animal kept smooth skin, you would actually see it quite easily because the background uh, is all bumpy and so forth. So I'll just tell you right now that the animals have very good eyes and they look, they visually inspect the surrounding background and make a decision of what kind of camouflage and, and what kind of bumpy or smooth skin pattern they're going to use. And we've done a lot of research on that to figure out what they look at visually to make that change. So you can see here that the change is uh, pretty dramatic from that to that. And uh, this is kind of easy to camouflage too. If the animal swims over here to another uh, area that's a better developed coral reef, well, they look at that information, they camouflage there. And they do this all within um, just a matter of milliseconds. In less than a second, they can assess the whole visual scene, complicated as it may be. There's a really complicated scene. That's a typical coral reef. This is the visually most diverse habitat on planet Earth, land or sea. And no matter where they go, they can camouflage in any little microhabitat. And I've documented this with my students and colleagues for years. We have a huge amount of information on that. So I'm not just making a guess that they can do it. I know they can do it. We have data behind it. So, you know, how did they do that and how does it work is a big issue. And there's another example. Now, so we call this rapid adaptive coloration. I just told you that it's rapid because it's direct control from the brain. Neurons go straight to the skin and light things up. Can't make anything happen faster in a biological system than they have a direct neural con, um, connector. It's adaptive because it's versatile and there's a lot of diversity. And of course, there's a lot of coloration. So a lot of patterns, a lot of fast change. Which of this biology can, can inform technology is one of the themes of the talk. That's why that goofy title, the octopus says tech. What does that mean? Well, here's a petal fish in Australia at night. Look at that skin pattern. Look at the change going on in here. They have transverse stripes that are broad, some that are narrow. They have these like waving clouds of darkness in the skin. Some spots show up, the white shows up. Now they're kind of yellowy. Now the animal is just gonna put a bar on and disruptive coloration, settle on the bottom and boink, it looks like something inanimate. So there's some of the change. Now, this, these are two squids on a coral reef, the Caribbean. There's a male on the left, female on the right. It's a mating pair that's uh, been together uh, during the day. And the male has been fighting other males. These are two males fighting each other. And now you see the skin patterning is used for communication and signaling, not camouflage. And there's a different signal on the dorsal surface of the animal versus another signal on the ventral part of the animal. 
and they can you know fight accordingly uh, with their top and their bottom so to speak and the winner swims off with the female who's way back here waiting for the winner and so this guy right there he goes and pairs with the female and he's paired and notice that the male on the left is showing a courtship pattern to the female a fighting pattern for rival males on the other side so if he shows that to the female she hits the road so watch him as she changes places and you see that he very fluidly put his courtship pattern on the side of the female so this is uh, dual signaling it's a very fluid behavioral context and the male is really being careful because if he didn't do that the female would be long gone by now if she saw that fighting pattern and he would have waited wasted a whole day of eight hours of fighting other males to court her so it's a really dynamic system so we joke sometimes and say okay there's the male there's 50 million years of evidence for the two-faced male you can interpret that as you like uh, so okay here's the broad uh, club cuttlefish look at the neural fast control of this that's real time we're not speeding this up and they show that to a crab that they're about to attack and we think that it mesmerizes or stops the escape of the crab when they see this bizarre pattern then of course the two tentacles shoot out and um, the crab is lunch so a lot of fast displaying going on there well we have a lot of tools and methods we use i'll just review them quickly here's me uh, on a field trip with you know uh, a giant mess of cameras and underwater housings uh, here i am suited up in a dry suit with several instruments at once uh, it's not much fun to dive with this because we have too many goodies here i am underwater with a big uh, video camera right there uh, here are some of the still camera examples sometimes we use underwater vehicles like this this is an autonomous underwater vehicle which means that it goes underwater uh, without a tether to the surface and is programmed to go a certain place in this case if you look in the right image you probably can't see if there's a cuttlefish there we were having the thing uh, go over the spawning grounds and to take mosaic pictures all along transects so we could quantify how many camouflage uh, animals there were picture in the middle is me using an ROV that's a remotely operated vehicle but you see all the tether underneath all this hose and so you control it from the surface like a little toy game uh, underwater and you have a video on the on the, the instrument and then you drive it underwater but you're sitting in luxury on the boat uh, here's a picture right here of a spectrometer it's it's in a handmade underwater housing and this gives us quantitative light data uh, we use a lot of microscopes which i did an image then here on the bottom left shows the laboratories here in, in woods hole where we culture cuttlefish and we have the european cuttlefish the same one that's right there in the uk the one you see in the marketplace and occasionally on the dinner plate and we get the eggs from england and we bring them here and we culture them so we have a, a colony of 100 150 cuttlefish in my lab year round with these facilities so i i work in a very large beautiful building that has a sophisticated seawater system uh, it's not as good as diving but it's the next best thing and here you can see some little cuttlefish they're only about an inch long culturing them in these little pens and lab and here you see the setup where we put the animal with different backgrounds to do its camouflage and then we close the curtain and we have a camera in there and we sit outside and we wait until the animal camouflages then we image that so we can quantify camouflage. Quantifying camouflage is what we're trying to do, which turns out to be ridiculously difficult. We've been working on this for 20 years. Uh, it's easy to say that's camouflage or a little camouflage or not camouflage, you know, put some numbers behind that and it gets difficult. I put this picture of the eyeball here because this is still one of the best scientific instruments uh, we have. And that is a keen eye and a lot of patients uh, will go a long way towards seeing things that are worth studying in more detail. Okay, so speaking of color, uh, we have made um, what's called a hyperspectral imager. It's just a fancy name for a camera that has many colors in every pixel. You and I, with human instruments like the screen you're looking at, only have three colors in every pixel, red, green, and blue, RGB, and tuned to the three color receptors in our human cones. So that's not a very good scientific instrument. So we made a camera with 16 colors in every pixel for the whole visible range, including UV, because many animals, predators out there, underwater and on land, uh, can see much more color than we can. Uh, so, so the question stated there, what does the color world look like in the eye of the beholder under natural lighting conditions out in nature? The, the, you know, the color spectrum changes dramatically when uh, the sun is low in the sky or high and so forth. 
different days, you know, cloudiness, water turbidity, all the rest. So um, poor us, we had to go to Indonesia and live on this beautiful boat and go diving for three weeks uh, to go to these remote islands. There are thousands of square kilometers of coral reefs uh, in Eastern Indonesia, a place called Raja Ampat. If anyone wants to look on their geography map and find it, you can have some fun later on. Raja, R-A-J-A, Ampat, A-N-P-A-T. And we go there because of these gorgeous coral reefs and no people, which means the reefs are in good shape, a shallow water, bright light, lots of colorful coral, so that we have a camera that takes a lot of color. If I dived here or I dived in England, we don't have much color. So that was a better place to go with the cuttlefish. Here's an example of us underwater. You can see how clear the water is, how beautifully developed the coral reefs are. Each diver has a different instrument. There's a still camera. Uh, there's the hyperspectral imager and a special made camera. By the way, the camera and the housing together cost um, about $600,000. So you can't go to the store and buy one of these. Uh, and it's spectrometers and so forth over here. Okay, so how to visualize. So when we take an image of a camouflage animal, um, we can take those 16 colors and we can remove most of them and say, a moray eel is a monochromat. It only has one of those colors. We leave it with one and it's seeing, you know, that scene. There's an octopus right there, believe it or not. And a colorblind animal might see this kind of image. You know, a barracuda, which would be a dichromat, it has two color receptors. Uh, might see a little more color and might be able to distinguish the octopus a little better in the color world. Uh, a snapper, which is a trichromat, like we are trichromats with RGB, might see this, but there are quite a few predators that have four color receptors. And the difference between three and four color receptors is an exponential difference in color discrimination. So, uh, you know, this is a diving bird and some fishes, uh, predators and some diving birds, which do feed on cephalopods. Uh, would have a lot more color information. We don't have this down pat yet, but we're working on this. This is very new information. So uh, that gives you one example of what we're doing. So we're only beginning to understand, you know, what animals see in the world of color. Uh, I think that's the, the lesson. Let me switch to cephalopod cognition because Emilio uh, really made reference to that and uh, Peter's book. Uh, there's an evolutionary context to this. If you If you look at the you know, uh, the linkage uh, of animals here. Uh, yes, we mammals are very advanced through evolutionary time. And way down here, we have the cephalopods, which are invertebrate animals. And the only common uh, link to these two groups were 600 million years ago. It was a very small worm-like creature that had a few neurons. But in evolutionary time, they took very different paths, but both of these animal groups arrived at complex behaviors, or what I might call, quote, intelligence, unquote. I don't like that word because it doesn't apply too well to cephalopods. Uh, but the big question really is, is the brain structure fundamentally different in a cephalopod from the mammalian, well, let's say the vertebrate line? And if it is, it means that there are two examples on Earth to create intelligence or high level cognition, if you will. The brain structure is being worked on now. We don't know the answer to that, but it's a, it's a really interesting, what we call a big blue sky uh, question. And there's considerable interest in that. But we would think that the artificial intelligence community would really be interested in that if there's another uh, model for intelligence that's evolved on planet earth, uh, even though it is in the strangest looking animal of all, the octopus that has its head on its feet, cephalopod. Okay, um, well, speaking of cephalopods, there's a drawing of an octopus. Uh, the brain, the central nervous system, has about 80 million neurons. That's not trivial, that's a lot of neurons. But what's really bizarre is that they have <laughs> almost five times more, four times more as many neurons distributed throughout the body, and most of them are in the arms and in the skin. And so, boy, they're really lit up with neurons everywhere. So this is a very uh, neurally endowed animal. Um, if you look at the brain here, you know, these animals have great learning and memory capabilities, very refined sensory systems. This is a true dissection uh, of a cephalopod brain. These are the optic lobes shown here in the diagram by the venerable J.Z. Young, a British zoologist of great fame. 
And so the brain is very large. There are about 34 lobes, depending on how you count them. It's a massive brain uh, dominated size-wise by these big kidney-shaped things, which are actually the optic lobes shown over here. These are optic nerves flaring out to the side. And there are all these lobes in here for learning, memory, and all kinds of things. And it's in here where uh, the visual information comes in. It gets decided upon what's in the visual background, and then it turns on the 25 or 30 million chromatophore organs in the skin in this very sophisticated orchestrated way. And they do it all in 200 to 700 milliseconds. So there's got to be a neurobiological shortcut to that. So we've been looking for that for a long time. But it's a sophisticated system. Um, now, if we look at uh, just these cephalopods in general, two newly discovered oddities have popped up. One is the genomes have been done on octopus and now squid genomes coming out and a few others. Um, and the genomes are absolutely huge. So there's something really bizarre going on here, even in the genome of these animals. Um, way bigger than the human genome. It's just bizarre. And there's, there's a lot of oddities about it. And it's just being that quest, those questions are just being addressed. The second thing is, is that most animals take their DNA, you know, make some RNA, the RNA makes a protein and, you know, you make tissue. That's generally what happens. But in the cephalopods, they edit that RNA a hundredfold compared to any other known animal, including humans. So they have the ability to take DNA and to edit it enormously, and presumably for the idea of being more adaptable and being fast. And most of that RNA editing, it's been, this is very new news, uh, seems to be for neural tissue. So that makes a, maybe some sense in an animal like a cephalopod that is fast, changes, adapts all the time. It takes a lot of neurons to um, make that possible. Okay, so rapid adaptive coloration. If you have a changeable system, uh, you need to control it, and the animals are doing it mainly by looking around them because this is a visual thing. Uh, so their eye, their eyes are very unusual. Uh, and the, the skin has to be really different too. I mean, we can't change color. All we do is blush or get sunburned, and we don't have much control over either of them. Uh, and so, uh, these animals have fabulous control of really elegant skin. And so we'll tell that story today. So I want to make a point, though, that the color change for camouflage and signaling is not a reflex. It is a complex decision-making process. Um, and so for, I'll just give you a quick example. An octopus and a squid have their eyes where our ears are. They do not have binocular vision. So each eye is always seeing something different. You know, what about if the right side has a background that says go into disruptive coloration and the left eye says go into model coloration for camouflage. They definitely don't do one on either side because every predator will see that. So they're, they're integrating information all the time. And it was really, uh, you know, quite sophisticated by any measure. So how do we, how do we test this? How do we test the camouflage and what visually controls it? Here's the experimental design. We give the animals some kind of environment and a little tank we put it in. And then we measure all that so we know the visual input. Uh, here's a little block uh, representing the brain, the black box brain of the cuttlefish. We don't stick needles in it. We don't do anything. The animal's alive, it's sitting there, and we're taking advantage of the fact that these animals, for primary defense, always camouflage, try to camouflage themselves on any background you put them on. So we put them on some really bizarre backgrounds, natural backgrounds and unnatural backgrounds, which is psychophysics approach I'll show you in a minute. And then they put on a camouflage pattern. So I, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, against any uh, intuition, we have found that the animals tend to have three basic pattern designs they use for camouflage. A uniform pattern on a uniform background, uh, a disruptive pattern on uh, a really heterogeneous high contrast background, and variations of a mottled pattern when the background is sort of mottled itself. So we test this down at the bottom here. You see the cuttlefish on a uniform background. It's on sort of a uniform pattern. We give it a checkerboard pattern, and it's now changed its pattern to a mottled pattern. And if we simply take that black and white checkerboard and we make it larger and higher contrast with the same cuttlefish, it goes to a really different pattern, which we call disruptive coloration. So if you look at the animal, it goes from uniform to mottled to disruptive. Well, I'm going to summarize now 10 years of work and literally 30 experimental papers that the animal is looking and paying attention to the white checker 
not the dark checker, and when the white checker is about the same area as the physiological white spot they can put in the middle of their back, they use that as the primary cue to say, I should go disruptive. It's not quite that simple, but almost. Back here in the model pattern, when the white square is too small, they pay attention to the dark square a little more when it's just uh, moderate contrast. So they put on moderate contrast, light and dark in their skin to blend in. And with real patterns, you know, not checkerboards, you could see that the camouflage can be extraordinary. Now, I'm not going to show you that today. Okay, out in the wild, here's a bright white cuttlefish, and it just decides to vanish from your eye. So it puts on a pattern and scoots down in the sand to get rid of its shadow, and it's hard to see. So before and after are very good. Now, in the laboratory, watch this cuttlefish. It's a uniform pattern on a uniform background. We rudely pull the rug out from under it, and under there is a variegated light uh, mottle kind of background, the animal stops here and puts on a mottle pattern. It would get rid of that white square if we gave it a few moments. This is real time, by the way, same animal. And so instead what happens is in the top of your screen, our special talented three-handed technician reigns in these white rocks from heaven and the animal looks at the white rocks and turns on a disruptive pattern because the white rocks are high contrast, about the same area as what we call the white square on the animal. So they turn that on. Now, here's what's curious: if they had stayed, if the animal had stayed there in a mottled pattern, 80% of the visual field says stay mottled, and they would have had good camouflage. But instead, 20% of the visual field has a priority in the brain in the decision-making process to say go disruptive. So we've sorted this out in the laboratory with real backgrounds and all the rest. Um, so this is how you can test this sort of thing. And then, of course, we have a lot of field work uh, to back that up. But this is experimentally how you can get to that. Okay, so um, we've done a lot of that. Let's switch the skin now. Uh, now you have those chromatophores close up through a microscope, and you have uh, a yellow chromatophore shown here, and the muscles are attached to it. And when the nerve says for the muscle to contract, it pulls that little yellow bag of pigments into a disc of color. And down below it, you have reds, and down below that, you have browns. So you have three layers in the skin of yellow, red, and brown pigmented chromatophore organs. That's what the octopus was using in the first video. Down on here, you have iridophores exaggerated in different colors, and you have a white base layer. So you have three layers of skin that give you the full color spectrum with a combination of pigmentary chromatophores on top and underneath are these reflective cells called iridophores and leucophores. So the skin is beautifully layered to give a lot of optical diversity. So this is one of the secrets. Now an individual chromatophore has to be flexible because the skin is always moving. So these radial muscles go way out in the skin and they're, they're, they're anchored out there so that no, no matter how much the skin is stretched, you can see against the underlying um, framework there, you can see how much things are actually moving. And so this is how the skin works. If you're going to make a fabric, you know, for clothes, you've got to have some color changing organ that can roll with the punch, so to speak. It's going to have to adapt to the movement in the fabric. And so their skin moves a lot. And so the animal uh, can do that. Now, this is based on a huge amount of uh, light and electron microscopy, what you're seeing this animation from. Okay, so we have colleagues we work with, engineers and material scientists up the road from here at Harvard and Boston, who've taken this idea of the color being punctate and not seen, and then pulled out in the aerial plane to a disk of color. There's no uh, human-made uh, color changing materials that operate that way. They, they produce their color and control in a very different way. So they've, they've got a patent pending on this to see if they can make uh, some fun human play toys to produce color maybe in a different format. And so this is all ongoing things. And it's all based on looking at the cephalopods and, and how the color speed is maintained and the control of it. So there's an example with folks we work with who are really making new materials and really seeing if they can come up uh, with some new materials. Uh, Lydia Madger and I were asked, um, you know, a while back now, seven years ago, to write an article in an information display technology magazine. 
that's a first for us. <laughs> We're biologists. <laughs> Someone way out there seems to be reading our papers. Uh, and there is in the box, you know, is this the future of displays? There's a picture of the giant Australian cuttlefish that it took long ago. You know, learning from displays in nature. There's a lot of activity in this field now. People are looking for models to change appearance, even displays, much less fabrics and other kinds of uh, equipment. Okay, now look at this. You, you just see nothing, and all of a sudden this iridescence shows up out of nowhere. These little spots are the chromatophores, and they're, they're not being innervated. Uh, what we're doing is we're stimulating a nerve bundle in the skin in that second layer, and we're turning on the iridescence. So watch in the next one where the color shifts. The neural control comes here, it comes, it switches from red through the whole color spectrum all the way over to green. It's going right across the color spectrum because with more neural control, which delivers a neurotransmitter, that's acetylcholine, it makes the platelet show up and then it makes them change the platelet thickness so that you tune the iridescence right across the color spectrum. This is an incredibly unique system and it's all based on a protein. Most animals don't change or don't produce color with proteins. Uh, only the cephalopods seem to do that to a great extent. And this protein is called reflectin, aptly named because it reflects light and it's really quite extraordinary. So very, very unique in the animal kingdom. And we and others are working, and I'll show you in a minute, how to take that and even use the protein in materials. So here's an example of some applications. Here's the paper at the top. Recombinant reflectin, that's the protein I just talked about. Uh, they can take that and, and these folks, uh, you can see in the second one down here, uh, put the reflectin protein into silk made in their laboratory uh, by you know, silk making little creatures. And they made a fiber optic device that produced color from a protein coming out of a cephalopod into a silk thread coming from a spider. Now that's really bizarre, but that's the kind of thinking that people are doing now with material science because you want to change color or control color. So uh, Theo Omanetto, uh, David Kaplan, I know these folks real well. They're really, really smart, um, forward-thinking folks who are doing these uh, seemingly crazy things. Here's another example down here uh, by another group. I'm not familiar with this group, but they're, they're using all kinds of materials like this uh, to produce some kind of active camouflage. So there's, there's, there are just dozens of these papers out just in the last five to six, seven years, uh, once they're seeing a lot of the biology come out. Here's another group. Uh, this is led by Alan Gordetsky at UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine. And he's taken reflectins and he's making all kinds of things. How could you imagine that a reflectin that produces light and cephalopod could be a material that stimulates neural stem cell growth? I mean, this is so far out, it's almost beyond comprehension, but there's some really, smart people figuring out what these crazy protein molecules can do. Uh, here's another one by Alon's group, uh, just uh, published recently in Nature Communications, uh, doing thermoregulatory things with materials, uh, again with um, you know this protein reflectin. And then Dan Morris's group at uh, UC University of California, Santa Barbara, he's worked out a lot of the details of the biology of how these reflectins produce color. Uh, but he's come up with a lot of options of, of how to really, you know, what's good and what's limited uh, with this reflectin protein uh, to make different kinds of op uh, optoelectronics. So there's a lot of activity in this field just with one protein for iridescence, the structural coloration. Well, I put a picture of a smartphone up here because all of you have one and so do I, and we're all hooked on these things. But I just kind of try to ask you very quickly, here's one right here. Where does the color and pattern come from? Well, you know, there's a battery in there and there's a computer in there. The battery has to be recharged every day. The computer costs a thousand bucks if you drop it and you have to replace it. Uh, and you go out in the bright sunlight and you can't see the darn thing because it's creating all the light internally. The point I'm making here is that the cephalopods can, can show these colors and contrast, but they don't create any light, new light internally. They are manipulating the available light field at the nano level to create um, the illusion of all these colors. So here's the secret in two words. They do it with pigments combined with reflectors. 
It sounds simplistic. It sounds like the movie, The Graduate, plastics. Um, and they're using these together. And that's what the animal kingdom is doing. And humans don't do this very well. Humans tend to use only pigments or they use only reflectors and they don't combine them the way animals do. And I think that's where animal kingdom gets a huge amount of diversity. So again, they're using available light and we think this is a really different route to creating new synthetic materials. So um, here's an example of how you can have pigmentary coloration. The little black spots are chromatophores in a cuttlefish, your cuttlefish uh, in my lab. Actually, I took this in Plymouth, England. Uh, and then down at the bottom, the bottom layer, you've got these white leucophores. Those are cells that are just sitting there reflecting white light. Now I'm going to put my cursor where I put the uh, stimulating electrode on the skin as we play this, and you'll see my electrodes here, then it goes to here and it occludes the white. I put it here, it accentuates the white. So you can either put pigments over the white or next to the white to get a huge contrast range. It's a very simple mechanism, but this is what the animals are doing, you know, in their skin. And then we want to look at this white because it turns out to be the whitest white ever recorded in the animal kingdom, except for one little white beetle that has equally white light. So we have one competitor there. Here's the, the wily cuttlefish, and you can see a lot of white in the pattern on the left. If you look at the fin up close, you see those white spots there. They're very white and brilliant. And now we look at them even closer with a camera. They're bright white. And now we're going to play around with them a little bit. And we're going to put a spectrometer on there, and we're going to measure the whiteness. Here we go from 400 to 700 nanometers. That's the human visible range that we can see. And it turns out that this thing is producing every color across 300 nanometers. That's every color equally well. Now the physicists look at this and call us exaggerators and even liars, uh, but we gave them the data and they couldn't refute it eventually because most animals can't do this. Um, and now we looked at the electron microscope and here's an individual cell in the leucophore with some extravagant electron microscopy where Steve sent from my lab, got rid of all the surrounding cells and highlighted a single uh, cell with 12,500 spheres in it. And we modeled that right here. And each of these spheres is full of a different reflectant protein. And collectively, these produce this pure white reflectance. There's no nerve, no muscle, no nothing. This is a passive cell doing a miraculous thing of reproducing a pure white light field in a white light field. But if the light field's green, they reflect green in every direction. And so uh, we've modeled this, we've emulated it. And uh, you wonder if you couldn't make a better Kindle reader, you know, the black and white Kindle reader, which uses available light, one of the few instruments out there in the human world to use available light instead of generated computer light, battery. And so they're looking at that. Uh, but could this be uh, a base for makeup? because you could have a base layer that reflects the pigments that are above it. This is not beyond comprehension now. We have enough biological data and we have a protein that does it reflecting uh, that would be a lot easier on the skin uh, than some alien chemical that people make all the time with makeup. And it turns out that maybe this is a possible sunscreen because it seems to reflect UV light, but we don't know if it does UVA and UVB. We're working on that right now but wouldn't it be nice to have a soft, you know, most of your um, uh, sunscreens are titanium based, titanium ox um, oxide, dioxide, I think, uh, which is a metal, it's irritant, irritant to the skin. So there are folks looking at that as well. Well, we're dreaming a little bit, but uh, dreams are what get you new discoveries. All right, so optical diversity. So here's just an example of some shots that I've taken of different pieces of skin on the top and then parts of the animal. And you just see the phenomenal diversity of appearances. And you get the pigmentary kind of color, but look at the blue iridescence in here and the gold iridescence over here and the green iridescence here. I mean, you know, it's just beautiful. It's like a peacock, only it can change uh, with pigments and reflectors. So there's a lot going on in that skin and we study the skin um, in great depth, pardon the pun. So here I am uh, really going out of my comfort zone and giving a TEDx talk at the company Este Louder. Uh, at least all the women in the audience will know that that's a pretty prominent cosmetic company. 
and I delivered the story I'm delivering to you that pigments and reflectors. I essentially said, if you want to be on top of the game now or 10 years from now as you are now, you need to develop changeable uh, cosmetics that an individual can control to some extent or change just for fun. And that's now doable with enough knowledge of the skin of different animals, including these. So it's a difficult uh, transition, but it would be an exciting thing to feed human vanity and Estee Lauder could get even richer. By the way, I was when we did this in-house talk, there were 50,000 Estee Lauder employees around the world watching not just this TED talk, but 20 others. But um, it's a big company. Um, OK, so here, look at the skin, the blushing here, the super fine tuned stuff going on with the pigments and reflectors working in concert just right. So we're looking at a really close. This is only a few millimeters across. So you know, you really have, they have beautiful control of the skin and we could emulate that maybe eventually. Okay, back to that 3, 3D skin. Uh, you can see this octopus, I already showed that to you once, but now I'm gonna show you close up of the skin, the giant Australian cuttlefish. It's like periscope up. Now these big papillae just jump out of the skin, goes from absolutely flat to papillate. And here is the flat skin close up. Take these videos underwater and you see that it's got many shapes to it. It's not just one shape. So it's got, this is a muscular hydrostat, kind of like your tongue, uh, but it's, it's like multiple tongues. All these little muscular hydrostats can add wrinkles and bumps or trilobes or all the rest. And so uh, this is the only animal group that anyone's discovered that can morph its skin into three dimensions under very fine control, creating different shapes from flat all the way out to every degree of freedom. Well, how do they do that and who cares? Uh, it turns out that, um, uh, here's a better illustration of the giant Australian cuttlefish doing this. I didn't have a video camera this day, but I had a still camera and I pulled the, the trigger as fast as I could. So it's about a second apart. So look at this animal. It's really got smooth skin and it's highly conspicuous, right? So in a matter of five seconds, we're gonna look at the transition. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five on a piece of algae and then they come back out of it in reverse and they turn into a very different looking animal so they also have this very beautiful control uh, for signaling uh, or for camouflage well um, uh, this uh, very smart gentleman rob shepherd at cornell uh, makes all kinds of cool color changing materials and he uh, called me one day and said we've been reading your papers and we think we can make some of those papillae and we can because uh, nothing in the robotics world, skin world, human world, no no material out there to do that. And then they did it. Uh, they took an example. This, this is an octopus skin papilla right here that we took in the field. And we work with them uh, to make this. And so they published this in science, uh, what, four years ago now, uh, because of this, is, this is a whole new class of materials to where you can control the shape. And they use pneumatics, high pressure air. Um, and they found, um, you know, some material that could be morphed into different shapes, but also would go back down and be able to do it repeatedly. So it's really an extraordinary bit of engineering. I was very impressed that these guys could take the idea and morph it into something uh, really useful. So they've opened a whole new class of materials that would have many applications. Um, and then just looking at complexions, you know, I already talked about that a little bit, but I want to point out that in terms of the cosmetics again, or even camouflage, you can do the dynamic masking of harsh edges is important to camouflage as well as cosmetics. You got these beautiful gradations of color and contrast and you do it with pigments and reflectors. Uh, you've got an untapped gold mine of biodiversity and bioinspiration, not just from cephalopods. And by the way, there are 700 species. So there's a lot of diversity there, but there are many fishes that I and a few others are working on that also change color and pattern. And they're all using a combination of pigments and reflectors. Um, I already made this point that they're manipulating available light, shape shifting, da da da. There are a lot of medical applications for, I, I, I'm getting invited to international meetings of dermatologists and skin specialists because they want to learn more about pigments and skin. Uh, that can change shape. Imagine pot marks and other things with scar tissue. If you could get a material like the papillae where you could morph it, it would really be a great help uh, to humans with a lot of skin problems. I do a lot of art and science. Uh, you see the same camouflage animal on the left, on the right, it's conspicuous. And I wanna point out 
that these are the features that they are manipulating to make this wildly different visual appearance. But this is the same thing that artists do and photographers, architects, landscape architects, makeup artists are all manipulating the same factors to get their end product. Marketing and advertising, you know, it's those um, annoying McDonald golden arches that are all over my country and even in yours. You can't not look at them because it's an arch, it's yellow, it's high contrast. They're just taking advantage of these things and they're brilliantly designed to make them uh, conspicuous. And so, you know, these are really widespread things. And the art community is one that I do a lot of work with. Uh, 90 miles down the road is Rhode Island School of Design. You probably never heard of it, but it's uh, among the top three uh, art uh, colleges in the United States. But I, I teach there occasionally and I have their students in my lab quite often. So we get a lot of inspiration and ideas from artists. So much so that I convened um, um, a meeting of three days and I had uh, half the folks were artists in the art community. We're talking about sculptors, architects, fashion designers, people like that. We brought in biologists to do visual perception. We sat down, I ended up uh, writing this book uh, that summarized everything that we did between the art and science community. And it, it involves biology, microscopy, imaging, modeling, engineering, and a lot of art. So we've actually um, you know, taken this to a pretty extensive uh, level. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is colorblind camouflage. Watch that octopus perambulating along. When it gets to that red colored kelp, it turns red. Now we're at 70 feet underwater off Spain. And so now the animal has even changed its skin. I'm turning off the lights. I had video lights on, which is equivalent to sunlight, but at 70 feet under natural light, the color change is easy, but even under brilliant full spectrum light, it was color coordinated. Well, guess what? These animals are colorblind. And so how do they match color? Now the answer is, uh, we don't know. I mean, we've been trying a long time to figure that one out, but we stumbled onto something really bizarre and interesting in our desperation to figure this out because in their eye, they only have one pigment. They don't have two, three, or four. So they're by definition monochromatic, colorblind. Uh, and we found the opsin molecule that was in the cuttlefish eye, the gene for it was not. And we did a quick and dirty gene search in the skin of cuttlefish. And wow, much to our amazement it showed up all around the skin so we studied this for a long time and we found these opsin molecules in the skin thinking maybe the skin can detect light do something with it maybe not for color because we'd have to find another opsin tuned to a different wavelength and after five years of work we didn't find that but it doesn't matter because this very smart guy john rogers at university of illinois um, he's a real genius uh, of making materials he looked at our talks on that in a big joint meeting and he walked over to me and said, Roger, we were reading your thing about those opsin things. No, you can't, you were not successful in finding a connection to color or light or changing chromatophores. He said, but you gave me an idea because I can actually do that in our materials. Usually it's the other way around. The engineers can't do what the animal can because it's too sophisticated. In this case, he had some cool uh, technology and he made these little uh, five millimeter um, rectangular squares and he embedded uh, in these little junctures you see the white and the black one there's a little place where all four of them meet he put in these tiny little lenses that that would enable what that material to see what's underneath it and so this was published uh, in PNAS pertains to the National Academy of Sciences because he took a little one of these little squares and he put UOI, University of Illinois, in white, and he put it over this, um, he put his little patch over the tube that had UOI on it. And that little patch without a computer or any power source sensed what was underneath it and reproduced it in the material. It's like, ooh, <laughs> pretty ingenious. So this was a huge step forward in how you would create a material that would emulate something nearby uh to give you uh a camouflage relative to something nearby so there's another example of someone taking an, an idea not even any real material and doing something really marvelous with it um now uh, just a quick foray elsewhere something we're doing right now is this octopus we got an octopus on the other side and it's blindly reaching its arms in trying to find food there's a clam which they like to eat 
And we're trying to figure out how, what is the sensory system of an octopus that allows it to sense what it's grabbed blindly and decide whether it's food or not food. And so we've got this nice behavioral assay. You see the octopus just popped up. They can't see under the dome. And we're doing this. And we, we also asked the question of how, how flexible is the octopus arm or the cuttlefish arm? Because who cares? Well, the soft robotics community trying to make robots for medical and other applications, all they have are you know steel joints and long rods and things that are not flexible very well. Now you look at this arm and it's flexible everywhere along its length. We actually measured that in a paper we just published a few months ago in scientific reports. And we, we really found out, I'm sorry to hit the button too soon, that the each of the eight arms is flexible from base to tip and can extend or retract it can bend anywhere in any direction and it can twist clockwise or counterclockwise torsion all along the whole arm so the roboticists just salivate when they see this they can't come close to emulating it but they're beginning to figure out how to do it so we and others got some funding from the federal government to study this thing. So that's one of the things going on that is definitely going to influence the robotics community. Um, so imagine if you went to get uh, a tracheotomy or worse yet, the other end around, uh, you, what kind of instrument do you want going down the middle of your body? Do you want some hard metal thing going down there? Or would you like some soft arm that's going down, uh, following that canal, whatever it is, to see what's around? that's why the medical community is really watching this uh, in great detail the same for crushed buildings and so forth search and rescue how do you reach people down in crumbled buildings you know some kind of flexible arm uh, with a sensor on it would be very useful so that's part of the idea okay just to wind things together for some questions this is a really exciting time in biotechnology uh, i'm a biologist i'm not a technology guy but you know the color and pattern and technology people are hugely interested in it and they're really putting it together uh, in very exciting ways um, nature provides a lot of things to discover uh, nature is so elegant i hope all of you pay a lot of attention to it uh, with a group of biologists in the royal society i don't think i have to convince you but i have to do a lot with other audiences um, and the oceans you know they've been around a lot longer there's a lot of sophisticated stuff in the ocean that you don't find on land. So there's a lot of biodiversity out there in the realm of color and pattern. Uh, and this sensory ecology, which is the kind of work that I do, you know, senses dictate everything we can or can't do. And that is different for every animal until you understand the sensory capabilities. In this case, great octopus cuttlefish vision to look at the background and to camouflage. I mean, it's really uh, a, a very well developed system. Um, and field work for me is where you find out what's really going on under natural conditions. That's my own bias in biology, and I'm proud of it. I don't mind stating it, and I'll defend it against any cell biologist or molecular biologist. But we do all that sort of work, too, so it's OK. Um, and here, the whole idea of applying um, you know, new technology and fresh questions, the technologists ask us questions. They're biologically really difficult, and they make us look at stuff that we weren't interested in until we work with them and they wanted to make something and it really is a two-way street which is very stimulating okay um i think we're there i just wanted to acknowledge that i've had just fabulous collaborators students postdocs in my lab this is they're not all in my lab right now i don't want to run a lab that big but we have many collaborators and students this is just a good sample of them. the you know four of them in this Thing are still working with me and we have collaborators all over the place this is just a few of them uh, two universities here university of chicago which we're an affiliate of the folks in um, california illinois harvard you've heard a lot of these this is taiwan wood Soul Ocean graphic institution is next to us in wood Soul. i do a lot of work in australia university of queensland university of adelaide university of sydney and uh, i still do a lot of work with folks in cambridge uh, where i spent a lot of time did my postdoc we have a lot of funding agencies, but down at the bottom shows the integrative approach we take to this. We do everything from behavioral ecology to neurophysiology to psychophysics to optical physics. Uh, and this is why you have collaborators and a lot of these folks, this are most of our collaborators on the top row here. These are folks who are all over the place and are really a wonderful group of folks who are very um, inventive and great, great collaborators. So, um, uh, with that, I show you a little saying that was put in our lab here in Woods Hole. 
in the 1960s by Albert San Giorgi. Discovery is to see what everyone has seen, but think something differently. And I leave it to that. This little sign is over the uh, library in Woods Hole, put there in the late 1800s by Louis Agassiz. Study nature, not book. Well, that's my excuse to go diving. So I uh, will open up the questions. Thank you.